Hi, and thank you for tuning into this YouTube video. If you saw my last video, you might see this little stack of watercolors here and think that I have been a busy, busy painter in the last few days. Uh, but in fact, this whole stack is paintings that I discovered in my collection after filming the last video in which I thought I shared every watercolor I ever made. Uh, but these were in tucked away in the pocket of my old portfolio. So yeah, I just thought I'd share them. Um, oh, this one has something on the back too. Just in the spirit of full disclosure, there were actually more. Um, I think I had mentioned in that video that I used to make things on Kadi paper, which is a an Indian brand of cotton rag paper that's entirely handmade. It's a really cool cottage industry where they support local artisans and local farmers. So this is what that cotty paper looks like. Um, this piece is actually acrylic, not watercolor, but it's on that same kind of paper. I'm gonna flip through these ones really quickly so I can get to the main point of this video. And they don't have stuff written on all of them like the last ones did. Although this piece says Gayatri, meditate on the energy that leads to enlightenment. And actually, even now, the Gayatri Mantra is one of my favorite of all the Sanskrit chants. It's Om Bhur Bhuvaswaha Tat Savitur Varangnyam Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Dhyoyo Na Prachodayate. And I didn't chant it, I just said it because I'm not in a chanting mood right now, I'm in a YouTube mood right now. Um, but the general translation of that mantra uh, is that we surrender to the transcendental enlightened energy within ourselves that's leading us to enlightenment. So it's like um, in the oneness of awakened realization. We already are enlightened and we're seeking our own enlightenment through our own enlightenment. And mind you, that's a really rough translation I'm giving. There are you know, beings who have realized enlightenment have given hour-long discourses on this, so don't take my word for it. But it's a beautiful mantra because it, uh, it, it's not surrendering to anyone external in order to lead you to what's already yours. It's the surrender to your own, um, your own inner intelligence. I'm staying on this one for a little while longer because I wanted to comment on how it's so much different than my other stuff as far as the color scheme goes. But I kind of like, what do you guys think? Do you like how there's a bit more black and a bit more gray in this piece? It's a totally different mood from these, the ones that use a lot of yellow. I think these are my favorite color palettes, the kind of neutral blue and brown. Kind of earthy, earth tone. I wrote on this one, see the music, listen to the Arcturian frequency of this color composition. Oh, and it's even dated. July 31st, 2011. This little guy was one of my all-time favorites. And it's so funny that when I did my last video showing all my other watercolors, I forgot about this one because I used to make color photocopies of it. And whenever I gave tarot card readings, if my clients wanted to note something down or, you know, write down the cards that came up for them, I would give them a photocopy of that painting and they could use it as their note paper. So it's funny that when I found Oops. When I found the painting, I also found a couple of the photocopies. So these, these two babies are up for grabs if any of you actually want a photocopy. Maybe um, because shipping is expensive from Canada. Uh, if you buy literally anything, even if it's just a $5 pendant or something from my Etsy shop, uh, if you mention that you want one of these, there's only two, but yeah, the first two people who do that, I will, I will gladly send you that photocopy. This color 
kind of turned out nicely too. I just love the way purple looks next to yellow. As complementary colors, they just pop so nicely. I'll have to do more of that. And then this is the last. I wouldn't say that now I've shown you all of my watercolor paintings because based on my past experience, there might turn out to be another stash hidden away somewhere, but at least that's all that I've found for now. Oh, and the top page is still blank on the other side. So yeah, with, with that little business taken care of, I thought I would make another real-time drawing video and talk a little bit because, you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart to those who are leaving comments and sending me messages and giving me feedback. I've heard from a few that, whoops, sorry, that was just me knocking down a little bottle. I've heard from a few of you that you actually like these really long videos where I just talk. And I, I can relate to that because the videos that I watch the, the most um, in my personal YouTube viewing are longer videos. I really like videos that are, you know, half an hour to an hour minimum. Um, I really like Dakota Wintz videos. I first found his channel when he made a video um, kind of at the height of the Nityananda cult scandal times. He made a video where he kind of gate crashed into the campus um, and, and questioned the people there about the, the fraud who leads their organization. But since that video, I've watched a few of his others and, and they're just really fascinating. Um, he's had some interesting travel experiences in his life and I really like the way he opens up on YouTube and shares those experiences. And they're long format videos, it's a lot of talking. And I, I like listening to podcasts. And I know I've mentioned this many, many, many times in a lot of my videos, but I really like the Peter Draws channel on YouTube, where he does his own style of abstract drawings and sometimes representational drawings. And there's less of a theme to his videos. Like I, I tend to pick topics and talk about them. Like I've got my ghost stories video and a video where I tell some stories about high school and this video where I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the almost unbelievable things that I have witnessed and observed in people in my years of working retail and you know, being involved with the public directly. Um, but Peter tends to just kind of talk about whatever he thinks of in his videos. And sometimes it's an hour long and the, the topics will be so random. He'll start by describing the flow of ink in a pen and wind up sharing just fascinating tidbits about his childhood and art school, um, and I think it's an acquired taste for that style of video that's kind of all over the place and really long. And I think it has a lot to do with different people's attention spans, um, because I do get comments on my channel requesting that I make shorter videos. And I mean, it must just be torturous for some people if the if the title of my video is like people are strange um you know funny stories from retail i don't know what i'm going to call this one yet but just as an example if i were to call it that and then they turn it on and for the first five minutes i do a watercolor painting show and tell and then i start babbling on like this they'll be like ah oh, like i just want to hear some funny stories about people um but for people like me and like you, if, if you're still listening to this, I'm sure you fall into this category too. Um, when you have a longer attention span and you are interested in the way other people's minds work and what they think about and 
you don't mind a more conversational long format video. It can get kind of annoying if you turn on a YouTube video um, and it's all style, no substance. You know what I mean? Like there are some of these YouTubers, you turn on one of their videos and it starts with an intro theme song that's kind of like, kind of silly, like almost like video game music. Um, and then they get right into it. And usually there's like a, an almost forced false enthusiasm, like, hi guys. I'm sorry, that was cringy. But it, it's cringy when they do it, right? Like, it almost feels like um, when I turn on a video and it starts like that, with, with a really obviously fake, over peppy greeting and theme music and straight to the point, like, so today we're gonna talk about 10 blah, 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 blah. It kind of feels like um, if I wanted that, I would just watch regular TV. You know, like I would turn on some network entertainment show and listen to what the advertisers want me to hear, right? But what I like about YouTube is the rawness of so many channels. Um, anyway, so yeah, if you're here, if you've given good feedback that you enjoy these long format videos, then thank you. And here's another long format video for you. And the idea for this video came up when, you know, I was thinking back to what I used to do in a day. I've seen a lot of people commenting on, you know, on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, asking their friends and their followers, like, what have you been doing in a typical day since the pandemic started? Of course, I'm filming this during the COVID-19 times. It's May 22nd, 2020. Um, and a lot of people have been, you know, sharing that they're spending most of their time indoors and they're reading a lot or, you know, catching up on a craft that they used to do. Um, you know, re introducing themselves to their old hobbies that they didn't really have time to do while going to work regularly. And so I started thinking after reading all of these kinds of posts, like what has changed for me since the quarantine, you know, since the lockdown? And I'm kind of, I don't know whether I should be ashamed of this or proud of this or just neutral about this but not much has changed for me as far as my daily routine goes. Um, I have a pretty standard daily routine. Like it's, it's not like every day is the same, but most days I wake up, feed my cats, make my coffee. Uh, usually I sit down and drink coffee for like two hours before I do anything else. It's, it's my little morning ritual. Um, but I drink coffee while going through my emails and Facebook messages and YouTube video comments. Not so much Facebook messages. I kind of, I kind of hate Facebook messages. Um, just because it, it seems like, if you've ever seen that cartoon Fantasia, it's like a really old Disney cartoon. I think it was Mickey Mouse. I, I haven't seen it since I was a kid, but the character is trying to get rid of these brooms, but every time he destroys a broom, it doubles and multiplies. And then he's like, he's got these like hundreds of marching brooms are basically like attacking him. For me, Facebook messages are like that. And now hear me out. Um, you, you check your notifications and you've got, say, 50 unopened messages. And I'm, I'm just talking about the inbox, not the message requests from people who aren't actually your Facebook friends. I'm, I'm talking like your inbox, you've got 50 unread messages. And you decide one ambitious day, like today is the day I'm going to answer everyone who has ever written to me. 
And so you start happily typing some responses to people, taking your time, reading their questions, um, giving a, as much of a detailed reply as you can to as many people as you can. And by the time you've been working for like two hours or two and a half hours, instead of 50 unopened messages, you've got 75 because every person you wrote a reply to has replied to your reply. And then on top of that, a few more messages came in for that day. And then there's still all the other ones that you haven't even had time to open yet. So it, it's kind of like, um, I mean, I, I don't want to compare it to those Fantasia broom demons, but it's for somebody who gets a little bit of anxiety when it comes to correspondence and responding to communication, it can be a little unnerving for me to try to attempt to tackle my Facebook inbox. So yeah, long story short, I spend my mornings drinking coffee. Uh, and similarly, if you've ever commented on one of my old YouTube videos, um, Please don't feel badly if I didn't love the comment or reply to the comment because that can also get super um, overwhelming. And so typically when I make a new video, as long as that's still the newest video, I'll check the comments on that one fairly regularly, um, but only on the very newest, newest video. and. You know, that way it, I don't get too burnt out by trying to answer literally everyone. But anyway, yeah, I, I usually spend my mornings drinking coffee and res responding to the newest comments on videos. Of course, going through my Etsy orders and if there are new orders, that's the time when I I give a handwritten thank you to everyone who orders something from me, so I'll, I'll pick out a nice card for them, um, see what they've ordered, pack it up in, the, in a nice drawstring pouch, make them a little gift. I always send a free gift with every order, um, and it'll be a different gift depending on, you know, depending on who they are. If it's somebody who I personally know, um, then I kind of know which stones they like and can customize the little gift. And if it's somebody totally new, sometimes I'll check to see if they favorited any items in my shop and if they had, um, you know, like if, if somebody buys, a, say, a bracelet and I look at their favorites and they also favorited another bracelet, I might make a little charm for them using the main stone in that other bracelet as, as like a little thank you for supporting my small business and, um, and as like a little free sample so they can see what that stone is like in person. And then after finishing my coffee and breakfast, of course, which is usually oatmeal oatmeal with walnuts and blueberries and cinnamon sweetened with maple syrup. God, I don't know, why am I telling you my whole life story here? What I wanted to say is that basically, since I work from home uh, and, and run my jewelry shop from home, most days I spend indoors at home. And if I go out, it's to the post office to ship my orders. And just rarely I'll, I'll visit with people and catch up with people, you know, maybe like once a week. Seeing old friends or seeing, usually on Sundays, my mom and my grandma and I would get together and on Fridays, my aunt. But uh, when I read other people's quarantine experiences and it's like, you'd think they had never spent a day at home by themselves in their lives because they're going stir crazy and they don't know what to do with themselves. Um, I just find it a little hard to relate to because for me, like my happy space and my favorite thing to do is to just stay in and draw or paint or make jewelry and 
you know, I'm a social person. I love people. It's, it's not like I'm antisocial or, you know, have some kind of an anxiety about going out and, and being outside with people. I love that. But I also love just being in. And I think that's why on YouTube, I prefer videos that are obviously made by people who aren't in a rush to get their video over with. Um, who take their time and, and they explain things and tell stories. And I think that's why, obviously, that's why my channel is also kind of structured like that. And at first I used to kind of apologize for making such long videos because, again, I would get so many comments from people saying, your videos are too long, it's impossible to listen to this whole thing. And so I'd feel guilty and I would try to make shorter videos, but then suddenly I thought, why? You know? Why? Why should I try to rush through it for people who can't be bothered to... You know, if they say they want to watch it, but they don't have time to watch it, then do they really want to watch it? Because if they really wanted to, I'm sure they could watch, like... 10 minutes at a time over the course of like a week if they really wanted to um but I'm really grateful for those of you who have commented that you like the long videos because I mean you're enabling me it's because of your comments that I feel like it's okay to ramble like this um but yeah as I was saying the idea to do this video came to me while I was watching, uh, not watching, I was listening to a podcast called Matt D'Elia is Confused. And he started, you know, telling some stories about crazy people in his building uh, and what they were doing in their elevators. And, you know, he was, he was just kind of pondering on the lack of common sense in some people. And I started to think, like, I think Chris Shelton put something like this on Twitter, too, that he was a little shocked by people's lack of common sense in a lot of things. And this might sound a little jaded and cynical. I don't mean it to be jaded and cynical, but um, it is what it is. I kind of lost faith in humanity having common sense like there's an expression that i've i've seen this on bumper stickers or something that says common sense is not as common as its name would have you believe and it's so true because common sense is kind of a rare thing not everyone has common sense and common courtesy same thing and, and common decency same thing so when I was younger, I used to really think that everyone has a certain baseline of intelligence. Intelligence might even be the wrong word for it, but like I said, common sense. I, I figured everyone, say, who has graduated from high school, and see, I don't want to discriminate because I know a lot of people who didn't get a, a proper education, who have much more common sense than other people who did get a full education. So let's not even set the bar as that. Just, I used to think everyone had a certain level of intelligence. And then I got my first job. So I'm gonna just get, jump right into these stories here. Um, my first job after graduating from grade 12 was at the body shop and on one of my first shifts I, I was standing in the makeup counter because um, it was my job there to demonstrate the makeup and you know tell customers about the products and you know the, the company policy against animal testing which I was so passionate about it was you know, for a makeup lover who's also vegan, I, th I thought I had found my dream job. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I was standing there 
and the customer came into the store and she looked angry. Like her face could have been in the dictionary under the word disgruntled. Like if, if just imagine what somebody disgruntled would look like. Like she was disgruntled. She had lost all her gruntles or whatever that word means. Um, but she marched up to me and <laughs> she, she was an older lady. Like keep in mind, I was 17 years old at this time. And this lady who was probably in her forties marched up to me and said, I'm going to sue you. And <laughs> it scared me at first, like, oh my God, she's gonna sue me. And, and then I thought, wait, but why? So I asked her like, why are you going to sue me? And she took out this like pad of paper and a pen and asked me for, for my details. And I, I asked her, like, why do you want my information? Why do you want to sue me? Like, it, I thought I was being punked or something. Like, I thought maybe one of my friends had hired this woman or maybe it was somebody's mom and that, that it, it was a practical joke. So I, I was kind of playing along, like, okay, why, why are you going to sue me? And then she told me that she had bought... <laughs> She had bought a container of this stuff from the body shop called um, Nut Body Butter. Sorry, I'm just gonna try to fix my camera here. Oops. It's telling me that the battery is about to die. So hang on, I'm gonna plug this in as I tell you the story. Um, so she said that a couple days earlier, she had bought a thing of nut body butter. And for those of you who don't know, Body Shop makes this really, um, really rich, thick lotion that come, it, I don't know if it still does because I haven't shopped there in years, but it, uh, its packaging was in a jar, not in a squeezy bottle, so it didn't look like typical hand lotion. It looked like um, it, it looked like a, a jar of stuff, and it smelled really good. Like it smelled good enough to eat, and apparently it smelled too good, and, and looked too edible, because this lady claimed that her teenage son had gotten really sick because he spread that nut body butter on a slice of toast and then ate it and that she was going to sue me because it made her son sick and so like this was just wrong for so many different reasons um for one thing because it okay if somebody ate body shop nut butter and got really sick and wanted to take legal action and press charges they would probably have to sue the corporation like uh, the manufacturer of said nut body butter uh not a recent high school graduate kid who's working at their local franchise um so that i mean like i said i i assumed before that people had a base level of common sense but here was a woman, much older than me, not only a woman, but a mother, a, a lady who had a kid, like she reproduced. There is a human being in this world raised by her. Um, apple doesn't fall far from the tree if that kid actually did eat nut body butter. If he has a mom who thinks that the next course of action is to sue a girl working at the store, then I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out where he got his smarts from, right? Um, so I, I asked this lady, do you think I'm personally responsible for the packaging and the fragrance of this nut body butter? And do you honestly think that a court is going to order me to pay you damages for something that I had literally nothing to do with. I asked her if she had the receipt and 
uh, if I was the salesperson, because if I had been, then that would be like the closest thing she could get to, I don't know, uh, liability for me. Um, and she had the receipt. She had, it, obviously somebody else had sold it to her. Um, and then she asked if she could get that person's information so she could sue them because she claimed they didn't warn her that it's not edible. But I asked her, like, what's the name of this store? Like, it, it's not called the toast shop. It's called the body shop. So it's pretty obvious that you bought this as lotion. I mean, there's, there's samples that you could test. I'm sure the salesperson didn't tell you, like, yeah, this is for the dry skin on your elbows and your heels, and it goes really well on toast. Like, come on. Um, and then I asked her, like, why did you keep it in the kitchen cupboard? Because I was kind of having fun with her. Like, keep in mind, I, I was kind of bored and working retail at the time. Uh, so I asked her kind of a loaded question, like, why were you keeping it in your kitchen cupboard? And she said, no, I wasn't. I was keeping it on the bathroom shelf. So I asked her, like, does your son have a regular habit of eating stuff off the bathroom shelf? Like, why? Why did he think it was okay? Why wouldn't he have just gone into the cupboard and pulled out some peanut butter? And she didn't have an answer for that. Um, and basically, the more I questioned her, the, the more I started to think this never actually happened. Like, her kid never actually ate this nut body butter. She just had an idea that maybe she can get rich quick by suing the body shop, you know, by claiming that because it smelled so good. Who knows? Um, but by the end of it, I convinced her that her story was so ridiculous and implausible and that if it had actually happened then you know it was her parental negligence for not supervising uh you know a, a boy who obviously needed parental supervision because otherwise he's capable of ingesting poison um so i mean if any of you know people with the body shop corporation just drop my name, maybe they'll sponsor some of my videos because I, I saved them from a potentially <laughs> ridiculous lawsuit. But that, that was the, the first experience I had with people that kind of shattered my illusion of basic common sense as a, as a given. Um, the next job that I had was at a store also in my hometown that was called Calman Dress. And it was a fairly, like as, as far as Lethbridge goes, it was the most high-end dress shop in the Lethbridge downtown. Um, we don't really have any luxury stores here. It, it's not like a big city, but you know, the, this store carried some designer names and it, it was known as you know, the place to go if you wanted a fancy, fancy sort of outfit. Um, there was a day I was working when these two elderly ladies came in and, and these ladies were known to Lethbridgeans from the time I was a little kid. They, they were like local living legends for being, <laughs> I, I don't want to get demonetized, so I'm trying to think of the the right way to say this. Um, they were escorts from from the time when Lethbridge had like a wild, wild west red light district kind of a thing. Uh, I, I'm just gonna say they were hookers, and and by the time that they were coming into Calman Dress to buy stuff they would have been in their 70s or their 80s and everybody in town knew them like the, if if ever a movie were to be made about Lethbridge Alberta they they would be characters um because they owned this little tiny um heritage house very close to downtown Lethbridge that was you know known as a whorehouse 
I don't know a polite way of saying that. Um, and they were basically like the madams of that house. Uh, and they were identical twins, little old ladies. And, and I mean, they were elderly when I was, when I was like four years old and my mom or my grandma would take me to shop at the Bay or Eaton's. Like they, we would see them out and about and they were like little old ladies even then. So when I saw them at Coleman Dress when I was like 18, they were even littler, even older ladies. And you couldn't miss them because they wore huge black Afro wigs. That was like their, that was like their uh, calling card, I guess, or their, that was their style, um, their trademark kind of like Bob Ross. He wouldn't be Bob Ross without his fake afro. Like these two old lady hookers wouldn't have been the two identical twin old lady hookers without their big black afro wigs. Um, they were the friendliest old ladies too. Like you would never know. You'd think that they were like retired nurses or retired school teachers if you hadn't heard like what they did actually they were very very friendly um but my boss pulled me aside the moment she saw them coming and said whatever you do don't let them try on any knitwear or or anything sewn shut like they can only try things with buttons or zippers and I asked why, because like, that's such a weird random thing. Like, don't let them try on any knitwear. Like, either they can try on everything or they can't try on anything. Like, okay, how come they have to try stuff with buttons or zippers? And then she told me that whenever they would go into the dressing room, and and I mean, they were shameless, these two old ladies, They they would, they would never close the door of a dressing room, so we had to form like a human chain blocking them off from everybody else in the store so that it wouldn't be disturbing to the other customers. Uh, they were just characters, man. They were, they were funny characters. Um, but she said that whenever they tried on knitwear or, or pullover tops or dresses that were kind of sewn as one piece, um, they would stretch out the necks because they wouldn't they wouldn't slip the clothing on over their head. They would put it on the ground and then step into it and pull the neck hole up over their bodies. Uh, it's it's like just try to picture that because their because their big black afro wigs were so huge that they couldn't fit clothes over them without messing up the style. So instead of you know, pulling the sweater over their, over their head, they would step into it and kind of shimmy it up their bodies, thus ruining the neck hole. Um, and I, I asked my boss, like, why can't you just tell them, don't do that? Like, why can't you just tell them uh, to slip it on over their heads? like a normal person and she said that they she had tried that once like not not she herself but somebody who worked there had once told these ladies you know please please pull the sweater over your head don't step into it and try to slide it up your body because it it damages the clothing it, it ruins the elastic and they got mad and apparently when they got mad, they would get really mad. Like they yelled at everybody and caused a huge scene. So it was just uh, something that nobody wanted to deal with. So instead it was just the store policy that, um, they were so old school that they would not walk around the store browsing and picking out their own stuff. They would kind of just start undressing next to the dressing room and tell us like, bring me what's nice, show me what's new. So, kind of like the Rodeo Drive style pretty woman shopping, like when, when you go to that kind of a store where you don't even browse, you have your personal shopper find stuff for you. So yeah, that, that was another funny experience learning about 
how different people's minds work that I don't know about you guys, but I never, ever, ever would have thought that there are people in this world who wear wigs that prohibit them from trying on clothing regularly so they step into their shirts and and therefore they should only try things with buttons or, or with zippers. Um, and there were a lot of weird experiences I had at that store. Uh, I got sexually harassed by an old man once who was there shopping with his wife. And that, that was a creepy experience because I was so young. Um, like I said, I started working there when I was only 17. So I, I was probably still just 17 when this happened. Um, it might have been after... My, no, I was definitely 17 because, because this happened in the summertime and my birthday is in December. And I was only there for a year, so for sure, summertime. Um, at work, I, I was wearing like black pants and a button down black shirt, fully done up. And this old man, and by old, I mean like in his 60s, uh, came up to me and said, I saw you yesterday in that pink dress. And just, you know, for, for clarity, the day before, I had been wearing a pink summer dress. I'll never forget it. It was a really pretty dress. It was pink with white flowers printed on it. Um, I don't think I ever wore it again after this incident. But yeah, he said, oh, I saw you walking yesterday in that pretty pink dress. It looked really nice on you. And I just said, thank you. And, and kept doing my work, you know, steaming clothes or putting away clothing that had been tried on. But there was something really odd about the way this man was leering at me. And I mean, other girls can understand what I'm talking about. You know, when you're just, you, you feel that you're being watched and it's uncomfortable. And it, it turned out this man and his wife were friends with the owners of the store um because the the store was owned by a husband and wife team and the husband came upstairs from the office where he usually worked which was in the basement to visit with this this older couple um and so he was chatting with them in a really friendly way and the lady who co-owned the store was chatting with them in a really friendly way and when she was ringing up the purchase, she called me over to help, which was a common thing. You know, as she wrote up the invoice, I folded and wrapped and bagged the clothing. Um, and then she, the, the owner of the store, gave a big hug to the lady who was shopping and to her husband. And as soon as the, as soon as my boss hugged each of them, he just turned towards me and grabbed me and hugged me too. Like as if, as if her, you know, my, my 50 year old boss, who he knew on a personal level, as if because she hugged him, that meant it was like free hugs, like grab a girl and hug her if you want. That's what we do here. Um, but he grabbed me and he hugged me and like I, I tried pulling away, but you know when somebody hugs you and they, they're squeezing you so tight that you can't pull away even if you try to? It was that. It, it was horrible. And then he whispered in my ear, your breasts looked beautiful in that pink dress. And like, this might not sound so extreme to some of you, but it... It was the grossest, creepiest, like dingiest, dirtiest thing I, I had ever felt. Like it, it, at that point in my life, I felt so um, violated and repulsed. And like, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm a little bit introverted. Like I, I like people, but um, I like my personal space. Like, I don't like it when somebody comes a little too close if I don't know them well. And I don't like um, people um, 
presuming to to speak intimately to me if they don't know me and I definitely didn't like a strange old man who was uh, there with his wife behind her back whispering some disgusting comment in my ear and and the grossest thing about about how I felt was that um I I was in a position where I couldn't do or say anything if if this had been like a random occurrence at a coffee shop if if some weird old man had just grabbed me and hugged me and whispered a pervy thing in my ear I would have you know slapped him and said f off and asked what the hell he thought he was doing and you know reported to the owner of the cafe like hey this this creep just said this thing to me um but because my my boss and her husband were both chatting so so lovingly towards his wife and to him it just felt so socially awkward like the the thought of of saying oh my god like guess what this jerk just said to me i just had this feeling that if i tried to say that that they wouldn't believe me you know and i i think that this is the kind of thing that a lot of um a lot of girls or a lot of women who go through that kind of of harassment must feel like it it's a it's not it's not nice um and like later, far later in the day, I did tell the the woman who owned the store, my female boss, I said, by the way, like, if they ever come in again, please don't, please, like, I'm going to go hide in the basement and don't call me upstairs because this happened. And she was horrified. Like, to her credit, she believed me and she said, you know what, he, he has been known to be creepy, like her daughters had had weird vibes from him and her daughters were about my same age um so she's like why didn't you oh my god like why why didn't you just run off the floor or, or say something and I told her like his wife was she seemed so happy and she was smiling like it's it's so weird but it's like I felt guilty you know I don't know I'm sorry I I didn't even mean to get into the subject matter I was just gonna tell you about like silly things that people did but that's that's a whole other issue of you'd think people would have common decency and common courtesy and you know if if you're forget gender forget forget if if you're an old man you don't deliberately go out of your way to feel a young girl and and tell her something pervy like man or woman like or or um however you want to identify like if if there's a person and they're not they're not flirting with you and they're not um giving their consent you don't grab them and hug them and just because somebody wears a pretty dress doesn't mean that that person is inviting you to comment on on their body like it's just ugh. So yeah, common common sense is something that it's not actually that common and common decency too. And I think maybe now in this era it would be less common, I would hope anyway, for that kind of of harassment to take place. Like it in the post me too era where where brave outspoken feminists like Rose McGowan have come forward about creeps like Harvey Weinstein um and it, at least nowadays I think if something like that were to happen to a young girl I would like to think that she wouldn't feel ashamed the way I had and and that she wouldn't be afraid to tell her boss what had happened I mean it's it's silly but sometimes I'll think back to events like that in my life and think, okay, if I could go back and do things differently, what would I have done? And it's, it's a stupid thing to fantasize about because you can never go back and redo something from the past. But I like to think that I would go back in time and the moment he, he tried to hug me, I would just 
literally bolt, like just run in the opposite direction. That's one thing. Or, <laughs> or I could wait until he whispers his creepy remark and just say, excuse me, like, why do you think you have the right to comment on the way my breasts look? I don't think your wife would appreciate that. Like, imagine just, just shaming him because what he did was shameful and he deserved to be shamed. And I'm sure he got away with that. Um, because although I reported it to my boss and I know that she believed me, I strongly doubt that she ever confronted him about it. You know, at the most, she would have probably told her husband, like, yeah, don't let, don't ever let our daughters near him because this is what he said to our sales girl. Um, but yeah, that disgusting creep, I, he probably got away with it. And I mean, these were wealthy people too. Like they, they were spending a few grand. He was spending a few grand on his wife's clothes. So it, it's probably a pattern throughout his whole life that he's done that. I wish I knew his name. If I knew his name, I would have no problem like looking him up in the Lethbridge phone book and, you know, calling him out on this or, you know, contacting his relatives and saying, by the way, this is what he did when I was that age. Um, but I honestly don't know. If I ever did know his name, I've long forgotten it. I'm, I'm curious, those of you who are listening to this, have any of you ever had a creepy experience like that and how did you handle it? Because it, it's, it's strange. Speaking of other, other strange, it, it's not that the only really strange encounters I had were with customers. Like I've, I've had some weird coworkers too. Um, one of the stores I worked at in Vancouver was called Turnabout. And I, I actually really loved most of my experiences working at that store. Um, my coworkers, for the most part, were really, really nice people. The store manager, in fact, was so cool. She, she was the... When you, when you apply for a passport in Canada, you need somebody to be a guarantor for your passport, which means that basically they're a Canadian citizen who has known you for five years or more, but is not your relative, who signs this paper guaranteeing that you are who you say you are. Like they vouch for you basically. So when I needed a passport, um, a couple of years after I quit working at that store, even though I hadn't seen her in a couple of years, she was the only person I knew in Vancouver who I had known for that long and who I knew for a fact, legally knew that I was who I said I was because she saw, um, you know, when I, when I applied for the job, of course, she saw all of my, my photo ID and my birth certificate and my social insurance number. So it was really cool of her. And in 2012, when my passport actually went missing in India, she did a lot of legwork for me. And, and to this day, I'm very grateful for that because I might have been stranded there if she hadn't, you know, signed and scanned documents and answered a phone call from whatever government agency contacted her to, to vouch for me. But there was one girl that got hired there that was just a little bit different. So, okay, t tell me like, hear this hear this story and tell me if you think i'm overreacting um because i think this was just ridiculous like just effed up like ridiculous um th there were two girls who both started new at that job they both started on the same day i'm not going to name any names uh so i'm going to make up fake names we'll call one of them We'll call one of them Cecil, and we'll call the other one Andrea. The random names. I, I really, I'm sorry if your name is Cecil, because it's going to make somebody 
with that name sound really bad, but only because I don't want to say what her real name was. So Cecil was um, kind of one of those loudmouth people who pushes her way into any conversation that anybody else is having. And Andrea was a little more shy and a little more soft-spoken and I, I was chatting a little bit with Andrea and discovered that she was vegan, like me. Uh, and that um, her boyfriend was not vegan and neither was my then boyfriend. And just the more that Andrea and I talked, the more I realized like, hey, we have a lot in common. And Andrea invited me over to her apartment. She lived, she had this really cool little apartment that was um, above one of the shops on West Broadway, like just for those familiar with Vancouver, for everyone else, this is like a useless random detail, but um, I think it was above the Popeye's vitamin store on West Broadway, like West Broadway, kind of close to Granville Street by that Safeway that's there. Um, so she invited me up for dinner and she said that I should invite my boyfriend because it might be nice for her boyfriend to have somebody to talk to about dating a vegan girl because she figured maybe they could relate, you know? Um, and so I did. So I called my then boyfriend and told him like, when you're finished work, come meet me at my, at the store. And you know, I met this new girl, Andrea, and she lives with her boyfriend and they've invited us over for, for dinner. Um, so he met us when our shift ended. And then um, the three of us walked, I think to the grocery store and we picked up something to eat that we were gonna cook at her place. And then we went to her house and it, it was an all around pleasant experience. And on Monday when I got to work, my my the store manager like my boss called me into the back room and she said that she had a really awkward conversation that she had to have with me so like i i you know that that weird feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when your boss says they have to talk to you in the back and that they have something awkward to talk about it's like like oh shit like what have i done like did somebody complain about me or or, or what is this so I, I followed her to the back of the store and she said that Cecil had come in that day, even though it wasn't her shift, she had come in that day to report me and Andrea. And I said, like, report us for what? Like, what is she claiming that we did? And my boss, like, bless her heart I could tell she was trying not to laugh um but she's like don't worry like you're you're not in trouble I just think you need to know that this is what she said so that you know kind of how to act around her um but Cecil had basically tattled on us and and told the boss that we had we had made plans in front of her and not included her. And that Cecil thought that this was against the store policy because she felt bullied by that. Um, and I mean, I shouldn't be laughing at this because this, this in hindsight, like now that I think back, this, this girl probably had some, some psychological issues that I didn't know about. But I mean, if you, if you want to make your coworkers resentful of you, then tattle on them to the boss and complain that they're making plans without you because that, that's like a guaranteed way that they will never want to include you in stuff. Um, and, and that girl just got weirder and weirder. You know, she would, she would sometimes disappear from the sales floor for like half an hour at a time. Um, one time 
in particular, I remember somebody had come in who wanted to buy a pair of shoes. And the way that Turnabout was laid out was that at, it was a consignment store, if I hadn't mentioned that already. So for shoes, there would be one shoe on the on the display rack and then the other one would be in the back room like we we put the right shoe out and then the left shoe was kept in the back so that way nobody could steal a pair of shoes they had to try one on and then ask for the other one so somebody had asked for a shoe and cecil had gone to the back of the store to get it and just disappeared like half an hour later this customer very patient lady mind you um, she came up to me and said, like, excuse me, but the, 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 the really big girl who works here, um, that's how she described her. I'm not fat shaming anybody, but that's, that's like, I'm just quoting verbatim what that customer said. She's like that, that really big girl who works here. Um, she went back to get me another shoe and it's been about half an hour. And so I, I had to wait to go to the back room until it cleared out a bit in the store because we were the only two people on shift at the time so it's not like i could abandon the sales floor um like you always have to have one person one one employee had to be out there so when i when the store finally cleared out a bit i went to the back and said like cecil like what are you doing and i caught her um eating a bag of donuts out of her purse. It was the weirdest thing, dude. Like, if you've ever seen The Hobbit and like Gollum with his, like eating one of those fish out of the pond, like she like both hands in her purse, like she looked up at me with that same look, like, like as if I was trying to take away her precious. Um, and I mean, She'd been back there for half an hour, so I mean, how many donuts did she stuff into that purse? It still boggles my mind. And and just regarding, like, common sense, it, it's... Okay, we got lunch breaks and we got coffee breaks, so it's not like, you know, she was trying to catch a meal at any time when she could. Like, it, it's... There had to have been. Like I said, in retrospect, even... Even when I planned to make this video and made my little mental list of all the funny stories I had from my retail years, it, it didn't really hit me until as I'm saying all of this, but it's kind of sad now in retrospect. There must, there must have been some psychological problem that she had that we just didn't know about. Um, so yeah, never, never mind. We'll scrap this little story for now because it's uh it's kind of sad now that i think about it there was something wrong with her but then the the next story i worked at was it's so hard for me not to just tell you the name of of the store I, I think I named Turnabout and I named Calm and Dress, which is okay because I didn't really have anything bad to say about them, but the next store I worked at, like, it was bad. So I don't want to get sued. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to tell you. We'll just say it, it rhymed with B, say, M, by. And a lot of people call it Dickney. It was that store. Really high-end fashion store. You, you know exactly which one I'm talking about now, I think. Um, but the, the lady who owned the store was weird and really hard to work for. Um, and around that era, it, this was like around the time, very shortly after the movie Devil Wears Prada had come out. Hilarious movie very relatable for people who work in fashion retail. And whenever the, the owner of the franchise would come in to check on us, it was pandemonium. Like all of my coworkers would take off running in every direction. Just like in Devil Wears Prada when 
Miranda Priestley, that horrible editor character, would come into the office, how, you know, everyone would scurry and scramble to try to make everything proper. And, you know, there, there was one day in particular, um, I was very, very new, very newly uh, promoted to floor manager, which basically was just a, a glorified title. It was like a promotion without a raise. It was awful. It's like, imagine you go to work and they tell you, you're doing such a good job that we've decided to give you more responsibility, but for not any more money. And so they had just made me floor manager. And what that meant was that I had to designate tasks on our chore sheet. Like if, if a section had to be dusted that day, it was up to me to figure out who had done the dusting before and get somebody else to do it. But um, guys, I was 22 years old at the time and my coworkers were all 30 plus. So you can imagine how much they wanted to listen to me. So basically I wound up doing all the chores every day because that was just easier than, than delegating. I'm not cut out for management. I, I'm pretty darn sure that um, I'm, I'm too soft on people. Like if I ask somebody like, hey, could you vacuum today? Because, you know, she did it last time. The moment they say, no, I'm busy. I'll, okay, it's okay. I'll do it. I'll do it. Like it was like that. I, I wound up doing all the chores. So this lady who owns the store comes in. And it's the first time I'm seeing her come in since I've been made floor supervisor. And slowly it dawns on me that this means I'm the one who has to go and greet her and take her coat and, you know, talk to her. Because usually the, the other person who had been the floor manager before would have done that. And that person quit. Uh, no shock there. So this owner of the store comes in. And I kid you not, guys, like she put on these like white fabric gloves. Like, you know, those gloves people wear um, like archivist gloves that you have to wear if you go to a fancy library and you're looking at their rare book collection where like maybe the acid in your fingers might damage the pages. So they make you wear these little white fabric gloves. I don't know where she got them, but she she snapped on these little white fabric gloves. And I, I'm sorry if this is offensive, but, but I, I can't not do it. She, the way she said my name, she'd be like, Sawa. So she comes in and she calls me like, Sawa. So I had to run up to her. Like, yes, 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 I'm here, I'm here. She snaps on these white gloves and she says, why so dirty? Like, why is the store so dirty? And like, we, by we, I mean I. I had vacuumed before we opened, dusted everything, um, frantically folded all of the sweaters so that nothing was out of place. Like, we kept that store spotless. And, and part of the reason we kept the store spotless was that they had video cameras in every single corner and for example, if, if we rang in a customer's purchase and then like stood there for a few seconds longer, if we stood at the counter for a few seconds longer after ringing in a purchase, the phone would ring and it would be this boss or her son, who was the, the main manager, saying, why are you just standing there? And, and we would have to go find something to get busy. So, I mean, if, if you worked an eight hour shift at that store, they expected you to be literally busy doing stuff for the eight full hours. And it, it's so stupid, guys. It is so stupid. If you're a boss and you own a business, please don't expect this level of intense, constant work from your employees because they will waste their time. So what we used to do to look busy is um, we, would, we would wait until a customer was in the fitting room 
And then we would follow them in with like a, a bunch more stuff that they didn't necessarily need to try on. And like right before they were finished with the dressing room, we would mess up that other pile of stuff so that when we cleared out the changing room and, and took the stuff to the spot that the cameras could see us, we'd have like an armload of clothes. And then we would take our sweet time, like slowly putting it back on hangers and chatting with each other and walking around the store, putting the stuff back. It, it's like, dude, if there's nothing to do and you expect people to be constantly doing, they will make work so that they can stay busy. Um, because otherwise, like she would expect us to redust the, sh the same shells, shelves multiple times throughout the day. Or like, there, there was once I remember, um, I couldn't believe she was doing this. She started vacuuming while the store was still open. And it's like she was trying to shame those of us who were working for not being like actively vacuuming at that time. But like she, she grabbed the vacuum from the back room and started vacuuming when there were still customers in the store, like vacuuming little circles around them. And like, dude, people left. Like <laughs> imagine if you're at the store and this weird frantic lady who seems super stressed out suddenly like grabs a vacuum and starts vacuuming. What, what message is that sending you? Because the, the message it seemed to send those customers is we're closing and you're in the way. So they, they scurried out. Um, but anyway, yeah, she, she puts on these white fabric gloves and then she starts going around touching things to prove to me that it's dirty because I told her I had dusted. And I'll, I'll never forget the look of disappointment on her face because she like swiped her finger with that white glove across one of the counters and then looked at it and she was starting to go like aha like to prove to me and when she looked at her at her finger of course it was clean and then it, it was kind of like a competition like she started going around um to any place in the store that she thought might be dirty and she started like swiping her finger across various surfaces and then looking and and it was kind of like um she was in a mad effort to prove that we were lazy and that the store was dirty. So she was actively looking for dirt and she couldn't find it. So finally, she, she told me like, wait here. And she went to the back room and she grabbed a step ladder. She climbed up to the door frame that was supporting the changing rooms. And she ran her finger across the very, very top of the door frames and and these are not like standard at home seven feet tall door frames like these are uh industrial retail commercial grade like eight and a half feet high door frames and she of course she found dirt there like yeah we we had not climbed the the 10 foot tall ladder to dust this shit um so she made me keep everyone in that day after work. It's like suspension, but for employees, like we were all suspended after school. We had to stay after work and, and dust all the tops of all of the doors. Um, and to me, that that was just crazy. And, and that lady, like she was, like I said, she reminded me of the Devil Wears Prada. And for the longest time, I, truly believed there was absolutely nothing good or redeemable about her because she was just so mean to all of us who worked there. Um, but her, her son was pretty cool, who had kind of, he was kind of taking over the business. And there was one day she had been particularly harsh towards me and, um, he called me into his office after work that day and he just, he gave me like a $20 chapters gift card and he said like, hey Sarah, like, I know you love to read because you're always bringing books to work and like, I know my mom is kind of crazy. His exact words were, I, I know my mom is kind of crazy sometimes 
and I'm just grateful for the way you put up with it and keep the store running. So, you know, go go buy yourself a book or whatever. That, that was pretty nice. Um, so I asked him, like, why doesn't your mom like me? Like, why is she like this? And he explained, he just said, like, no, the, the way she was raised in Hong Kong was like that it's very classist there which i didn't realize because i mean it, it goes to show my ignorance about other cultures around the world but if if i had thought about china and i i naively assumed that hong kong and china were the same which obviously they're different um hong kong i think has independence it's like a city state separate but you know, I assumed it, it's all kind of communist and that there's not a class structure, which is totally untrue. Like, I, I don't know enough. I, I would only show more of my ignorance if I tried to give detailed examples of what it's actually like there. But, you know, this guy kind of explained a bit of it to me and said the, the way she had been raised was that they don't talk to the help. They, they don't chat with the help. And I, I was the help as a shop girl. Um, it would be kind of akin to being their servant. So he said, it, it's not that she doesn't like you, that, that she just comes in and straight away starts yelling at you and bossing you around. It's, it's that to her, as long as you're on shift and getting paid, um, you basically belong to her. and. You know, to be honest, it was it was basically from that day onward that I stopped putting in any effort whatsoever and thinking, okay, so if that's how this is, if she thinks I'm her property, like, let's see how far I can push it before I got fired. That lasted a few months. So again, if, if any of you guys own a business, don't do that to your employees because it only makes them really resent work and try to see how much they can get away with. But yeah, um very strange there was there was another coworker i had there who was actually a, a beautiful lady she she looked like she could have been like a persian princess or something actually there there were two ladies there from iran and and both of them were just stunningly beautiful and i learned all kinds of things about persia um for example, in French, when you say thank you, it's merci. Uh, they would say that in Farsi too. I didn't realize there were some words in common. Um, but but one of those Persian ladies, she was a, an older lady. She was in her 60s, had led a very, like, my God, the life this woman led and the stories that she could tell were just unbelievable. Um, she had been married to a, a very wealthy general who was kind of like royalty in in Iran. Um, but he was very violently abusive towards her to the to the point that I think she said that he had actually broken one of her bones beating her. So she escaped the country um, because in, there it wasn't illegal at that time. Um, for a, a husband to beat his wife. So she had to flee. And that's how she fled to Canada. So she was working at a retail store. And back in her country, like she had never had to work. Because, you know, born into privilege. Um, but she said that, you know, there was one day she was telling me that there would be no job in Canada so bad that it would be worse than living with all her servants and, and all her maids in that abusive relationship in Iran. So, I mean, she was a fighter. She was a tough lady, very cool. I, I feel benefited for having known her, um, but she was also a pain in the ass to work with sometimes because she would get very stubborn about very silly little things like, um, when they switched over to a new computer system, so we had to log in differently at the beginning of our shifts, 
She thought that that was silly and refused to. She, no, I know how to log in my way. I'll log in my way. You log in your way. I'll log in my way. And it was hard to try to explain to her that like, if you don't log in this new way, then it's not going to show that you're here and you won't get paid. Like you had to convince her uh, to do the stuff that she had to do. Um, so like I said, in, in some ways she was just this amazing, inspiring survivor. And then in other ways, like I just wanted to tear my hair out when I worked with her. Um, and there was this really hilarious incident that happened with her where at that time there was a show in Canada called Little Mosque on the Prairie and I never watched the show because I, I've never had TV since moving away from home. I've only ever had a laptop so I've only ever watched YouTube. Um, but yeah, there, there was a show called Little Mosque on the Prairie and the guy who was the star of that show came in and he bought a bunch of clothes and, and this Persian lady was the one who served him. So she had helped him pick out a suit and whatever else he was wearing. And one of my other coworkers recognized him. So after he left the store, this other coworker of mine went up to this lady and said like, hey, do you know who that was? And she said, no, like, no, I don't know. Like who, who? And so he tried explaining. He's like, oh, he's a very famous actor. And she immediately started jumping up and down saying, oh my God, was it Borat? Is he Borat? Did I just sell pants to Borat? And my coworker was saying, no, no, no. He's like, he's a different actor. He's not Borat. Like, um, I tried explaining to her. I tried to tell her like, hey, I, I almost said her name, but I... I'll just say her name. None of you will ever be able to find this lady. She's probably not even on social media. Uh, but I just said, like, no, Mahnaz, Borat isn't even Borat. Like, Borat is a guy named Sasha Baron Cohen who does the character of Borat. Like, he's not an actual person. And she's like, no, like, Borat is Middle Eastern. This guy was Middle Eastern. They're both actors. I'm sure it was Borat. You're, you're trying to confuse me. And... Like we just gave up. And so from that day on, for the next like week or so, every customer she served, she said, by the way, Borat shops here. I've, I've sold clothing to Borat. And it was, uh, like I said, it's one of those things where you'd, you'd like to think that people have some common, common sense, but then you meet somebody like her where you tell them who an actor is but they've already like made the decision in their mind that like, no, I'd rather pretend to continue to believe that it was this even more famous person. I'm, I'm just gonna go with that. It's almost like unfathomable, but like guys, people like that exist in the world. Like there are people to whom you can explain, Borat is a character. It's not actually who Sasha Baron Cohen is. And they will still believe that somebody else they met who looks nothing like him is actually him. Anyway, it, it was very funny. I guess you had to be there. I, I had other funny retail stories, but like, as per usual, I've babbled on for an hour and 23 minutes. So, and, and obviously I'm, I'm long done with this coloring book illustration. It's going to be one more page in that upcoming coloring book. And like I started by coloring in some of it and making some lines darker. I'll probably go through and darken some other lines too, just so that there's consistency in the piece. Uh, but besides that, the, the general, the general idea is already there. It's, it's basically, this is as much detail as I'm going to add to this piece. But anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a little different from the others on my channel in that there's not really a point to any of these stories. Like, what did I learn from all of this? Um, I guess just like some people are strange and you, you can't really explain something to somebody who doesn't want to learn and expect the unexpected. Like, I, I guess if you're 
if you're working in an environment with other people, you're just gonna have to brace yourself for the possibility that maybe they're gonna gall them a bag of a bag of donuts out of their purse and, and leave you stranded on a sales floor with a busy store for half an hour. Um, maybe an actor will come into your shop and instead of being cool about it and saying, wow, that's nice, they'll try to convince you that it was Borat and that you're wrong and then they'll brag about that to everybody. Um, you know, maybe maybe you'll sell somebody some hand lotion and they'll try to sue you by pretending that their son ate it on toast. Like, people do some weird stuff, man. And, and I mean, this is just like mainstream work environments. Uh, this, this isn't even talking about some of the people who would attend programs in the fraudulent cult organization in India that I was you know, sucked into and convinced to believe in, like, th there were some very strange, I mean, there was a lady in one of those programs who deliberately peed her pants on multiple occasions um, to protest the length of the meditations. Like, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've met some strange people and I've seen some strange things and I guess just just for fun out of curiosity maybe type in the comment like have you ever seen somebody in a store or at school or in a workplace or i mean maybe you've got a weird family member like what's what's the craziest weirdest randomest thing you've ever seen somebody do in real life that that actually happened but that's kind of hard to believe um I'm curious, I have fun with this kind of thing. And did you enjoy this video? If so, I can definitely do a part two and tell some more crazy, weird experiences uh, that I've had with people. And don't worry if you're one of the people who's commented that you're interested in seeing the video I've been kind of talking about for like a month now where I'm going to do one of these real-time drawings and talk about going vegan in 1999. I'm definitely still going to make that video. Um, to be totally honest, I just really get sick of negative comments. And I know there's gonna be some meatheads out there who, who want to leave like argumentative, angry, accusational stuff in the comments beneath that one so I'm kind of just putting in some fun videos as a as a way of bracing myself for that because believe it or not even though I've thrown myself into passionately exposing a cult and even though I am a very outspoken vegan um, and even though I talk about things like religion and politics I don't actually enjoy getting into arguments. Like, I don't find it exciting or exhilarating to clash opinions with people and, you know, receive the brunt of all of their aggression and frustration. It's such a funny thing because I, I can kind of... I... I I kind of want to say to myself, like, you asked for it, like, when you went public and started making YouTube videos, when you put yourself out there, of course, it's the internet, of course there are going to be people antagonistically attacking you, like, it's to be expected. But at the same time, um, I always make these videos in hopes that people who find this interesting or inspiring or relatable or entertaining like of course my my goal is always that other people who are kind of like me who see things similarly to how I see them um will watch these videos and comment beneath and engage with me and be friendly and you know start chats that are you know, like, hey, I've also encountered this. Whoa, I can relate. Like, I'm putting these videos out there because 
if somebody else put a video out there about this stuff, I would watch it and be interested. Just like how I watch Peter Draws and I watch a lot of really fun art channels because uh, I can relate to the content. And I watch this guy Mick the Vegan who, um, he's just amazing. He puts into words the, the scientific data and um, research information, like he articulates in his videos everything that needs to be said to debunk all of the main criticisms against veganism so much more scientifically and accurately and articulately than I could ever hope to do. And so part of the reason I don't talk much about being vegan on my YouTube channel is that there are more able-minded vegans out there doing a far better job of that than I could ever do. Like Earthling Ed. He just, he has a way of speaking to veganism in such a non-judgmental, non-critical, non-harsh space that it doesn't come across as aggressive towards people who are not vegan yet. Like he is just, um, diplomatic in his approach. And I kind of fear that if I start talking about veganism, I'm going to alienate and agitate and anger and infuriate a whole shitload of people because I don't have the, the same patience um, for animal cruelty. Like I, I'm the kind of person that if I see, for example, in a road trip across Canada once, our car came up behind a, a transport. God, I'm tearing up. We pulled up in traffic behind a transport truck that had like air holes. It was obviously taking pigs to the slaughter. And I could see the snouts of those pigs coming out of the holes in that truck to try to get some fresh air. And I, I cried like, unconsolably for the next hour, like loud sobbing wails. Um, shit, I shouldn't have brought this up because it, it's like, I'm tear, like, I saw those animals and in that moment felt this, this dreadful helplessness where here is a truck full of innocent beings being taken in like horrific, dirty, overcrowded conditions. It was a summer day, so like 35 degrees Celsius. I can't imagine how hot it was in that metal container, like overcrowded, like they, their lives have been shit and now they're going to be killed and eaten by people. And I'm, I'm the type of compassionate being that when I see animals suffering, I can't make a distinction between um, those pigs, for example, and my little cat Oreo here, who is sleeping, you know, so, so patiently. She's been sitting here as I filmed my video, just waiting to get her cuddles. Um, you know, if, if anybody tried to hurt her, I would aggressively fight them off. And when I, when I saw those pigs on the transport truck in traffic, or if, if I see, um, a cattle ranch and I see cows in the field as I drive past, I can't not passionately wish that those animals could live their lives naturally and not be, not be slaughtered at the end of it, you know? Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not interested in debating with meat eaters. I'm just there is nothing that anybody can ever say to me that will ever convince me that it's okay to torture creatures and raise them in horrific conditions and then brutalize them and then kill them and then eat their corpses when instead we could just have like nuts and seeds and beans and legumes and tempeh you know, and Satan and other completely 
harmless, non-violent foods. Like, it's, it's not like we're in, it's not like we're living in the Arctic Circle and if we don't eat whale blubber, we'll die. Like, come on guys, like we, we have plenty of access to healthy foods. Much, okay, I'm going into a vegan rant which is exactly what I've been avoiding on my channel because I don't want to get bombarded with hate in the comments. So I'm just going to say it right now. Like if, if you disagree with this, fine. But if, if you disagree with this and leave a comment trying to justify um, killing animals or, or if you like, if you try to shit talk me for being a passionate vegan, just I'll delete the comment and block you. Like that's that's all there is to it. Like, I I don't want to make this a debate channel where you know everyone can come and and dump their crap on me because they disagree with what I'm saying. And I don't mean to polarize people. I don't mean to say like either agree with me or get lost. It's it's more like if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. Um, I mean I've I've made a lot of videos where I talk about things that I don't like. For example, um, I strongly disagree with the YouTuber named Teal Swan, who really misleads people to the level that it's kind of like spiritual abuse. Like she, um, she preys on innocent seekers and, and gives them really bad advice. I've, I've mentioned that in videos on my channel, but I have never and, and like, you can look into this if you don't believe me, but I have never, ever gone to her channel and disliked a video or left a negative comment because it's, it's just pointless. Like, all that that would do is make her or one of her admins feel bad. And I'm, I don't want to make them feel bad. Ideally, I would love for her to just be a better person. And you know, if she's giving people advice, then give them good beneficial advice instead of something that serves her agenda of trying to convince others that she's some kind of a, of a savior to them. You know, you can help people without, without imposing, your, imposing on them that you are their guru or guide or whatever, you know? I. I would love for her to just be successful and happy and heal from the past trauma she's experienced and help other people do that too. Like, I want the best for people. So even people I disagree with, you know, I, I watch a lot of Joe Rogan's podcasts and he is far from vegan and sometimes he talks about um, exactly what I was saying. I don't want to get into arguments about. He'll start, you know, riffing trying to debunk like the documentary What the Health or The Game Changers. I find that so annoying because these are well-documented documentaries with expert opinions from medical professionals far more qualified than him to talk about this stuff. But whenever he goes into something like that, I'll just skip 20 minutes of the podcast and, and find where the topic changes and then listen to him talk about other stuff because I find him fascinating and his his guests are usually really interesting. So instead of like leaving a dislike and leaving a bitchy comment about the thing I disagree with, I'll just listen to the parts I want to and ignore the parts I don't want to. And I mean, maybe this is expecting too much from people. Obviously, if you've listened to this point in my video, if, if you've listened to me babble on for an hour and 38 minutes and 44 seconds, then then thank you. Like, I, this isn't even for you. This is just me, I guess, ranting now. But is it expecting too much of people to expect them to extend to me the same courtesy that I would extend to them? Because if any of my critics or if any of the trolls had their own channel where they made videos that I didn't like, I would never, ever, 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 I would never waste my time by watching a video that I don't like and then leaving a mean comment under it. 
to me, that sounds like the worst thing. Like, oh, like I'd rather just watch the stuff that makes me happy, comment about the things I like about it, skip over and ignore the stuff I don't like, and just live a, a happy, sheltered existence where I surround myself with positivity. How about you? Like, how do you feel about that? Like, there are some people I know who, who genuinely enjoy um, debate and argument. It, it's interesting, speaking of the Joe Rogan podcast, like there, there's an episode where he interviews Leah Remini. Um, she's that, that famous actress who left Scientology and then created the expose series called Scientology and the Aftermath on A&D. Um, Joe Rogan interviewed her and at one point in the interview, he said to her, like, do you ever feel glad that you were in that cult and got out of it? Because now, like, you seem like you really enjoy the battle. Like, you, you have fun taking them down and destroying them. And, and she was like, what? Like, are you kidding? Like, no. Like, she, the way she said it, she's like, no. Um, I would rather just you know, enjoy joking around with my family and taking on fun comedy roles and going out drinking on the weekends. Like, I don't enjoy this. And I I totally understand what, he, what Joe Rogan was saying, because I, I get how it looks like whistleblowers get some kind of a cheap thrill out of, I don't know, like, um, blowing the whistle for like, I mean, pardon my lack of vocabulary on this. I don't know any other words for it, but I can see how it seems like somebody like Edward Snowden got a kick out of, out of leaking to the American population how their privacy rights were being violated, you know? But if you see interviews with him, he does like he was proud to work for the CIA like it it was his family legacy like it's what he always aspired to do through his whole life was be there back when he thought they were the good guys he didn't go into that line of work um with the goal of finding dirt on them and leaking it to the public you know and getting accused of treason that was the last thing he ever imagined for his life and I mean, similarly, I did not go to the fraud who calls himself Nityananda, that fake guru that I gave nine years of my life and $20,000 of my hard-earned money um, and like $40,000 of my mother's money for the programs I convinced her to attend. Like, I did not get sucked into that cult with the thought of, you know, one day I'm going to have all of their dirty secrets and reveal them to the public. I went in naively believing that he was an incarnation of the god Shiva and that I was doing a really dharmic thing by worshipping him and promoting him. I don't, I don't enjoy blowing the whistle. If, if I could wave a magic wand and change the whole situation so that his gurukul was actually a non-violent residential school for kids to be raised in the proper Vedic tradition. And, you know, where his goshala is an actual farm sanctuary where cows are treated lovingly and compassionately and, and allowed to live their natural lives. Um, and where sannyasis live the scriptural yogic path to enlightenment and where he is actually a decent, authentic version of what he claims to be, I would choose that. I, I would rather that he was a really good guy and that his organization did great things for humanity. That would be ideal, but that's not the reality. And so I'm sharing what the reality actually is so that other people who are idealistic like me, who would love to believe that he is what he claims to be, so that they don't fall into the same trap I did. And it's kind of like that when it comes to veganism. I don't like 
confrontation. I don't like conflict. I'm vegan because I'm compassionate, right? Like I don't want any beings to suffer unnecessarily. So I don't get a kick out of out of arguing with non-vegans and asserting that I'm right and proving my points and fighting. If I had it my way, everyone would be a healthy, happy, active, vibrant, vital, properly nourished, joyful, enthusiastic vegan, and there would be no need for conflict and argument about it because animals would be happy and well-treated. Humanity would be happy and well-treated. There would be no more, um, I mean, global hunger would be eliminated. Nobody would be starving. There would be plenty of produce to go around. Anyway, all I'm trying to say here is that I've tried to make videos about the light subject matter, high school stories and retail stories because I'm pretty sure that the moment I make a video that has the word vegan in the title, it's going to be like a, like a magnet for all of the people who like to troll on vegans and tell disgusting hunting stories in the comments or you know, comment like mm, bacon or like don't you miss cheese or other like dumb shit like that that I've I've had to endure for 21 years now that it was old before it was ever even done the first time. And I, I just don't want that kind of negativity anymore. Um, part of the reason I'm taking my channel more in the direction of visual arts is because this is something that makes me happy. And I think it makes other people happy too. And I, I'm up to seven pieces now. Seven different viewers have sent me images of art that they've started making after seeing these videos and getting inspired. And that is such a cool thing. Like that, I love that. Um, probably by the end of June, I'll be ready with a video showing art submitted by viewers inspired by these videos. And I mean, if you want to get in on that, definitely post some of your work on Instagram and tag me in it. That's the, the best way to be guaranteed that I see it and can add it to that, to that video. Um, but I mean, guys, like maybe, maybe I need to just get a little braver and start talking about things that are controversial again, regardless of the backlash that I know is going to come. Like for example, I started making videos where I shared my jewelry and the different crystals and gemstones that I work with and that I love. And do you know why I stopped making videos about that? It's because people kept trolling me, um, particularly people who are still members of the cult that I left, started commenting like um, that I'm trying to deceive people and rip them off just like Nityananda does. and I'm. You know, I'm trying to peddle my crystals and it's another charlatan thing. So I stopped making those videos because I thought, well, damn, that's not what I want to do. But I'm starting to think, wait a minute, but you know, those videos did make me happy. And the way I earn my living is by selling gemstone jewelry. So why shouldn't I share that on my channel? It's not like anybody has to watch it. And it's not like I'm saying that you have to buy the stuff I'm showing you. Like, even for this video, I wore a couple of the newest bracelets that I made. I made these just yesterday. I made these and added them to my shop uh, because I wanted to do some things kind of in like the, the fresh spring colors. So we've got like green opal, blue appetite, and kunzite. They're just happy springtime colors. And I was thinking, here's another new one, oops, with angelite, amazonite, kunzite, and prenite. I, I thought like, yeah, I'll, I'll wear some of my shop items in the video. Um, but you know what? What's wrong with just talking about what stones I'm using? And of course, with a, with a little disclaimer that you know, crystal healing is not an alternative to actual medicine and that 
it's not guaranteed that what crystal healers say a stone is going to do will definitely happen to everyone who uses it. I think I've said plenty of times now that it's very likely psychosomatic. Like, I, I'm not going to deny the, the possibility that the reason gemstone healing works is a placebo effect. It's very likely. Um, but even, even if it is placebo effect, placebo effect is a good thing. If you convince yourself that by wearing a specific stone, you're going to be more productive and more happy and more successful. So you wear that stone and trick yourself into believing that you're more successful and more happy. And therefore you become more successful and more productive and more happy than like, where's the downside, right? So it, it's kind of like, um, I prefer to believe that there actually is a positive energy intrinsic in these stones based on the color spectrum and based on the earth energies from which they're born. Because whether that's rational or not, I like that. I, I would rather believe that that exists than believe that everything is dull, dead matter and it's pretty and that's all there is to it. I, I love the Book of Stones and I love the series by an author named Melody who's written a series called Love is in the Earth about basically the, the fact that minerals are a manifestation of the positive energies that are helpful and beneficial to people in life and that it's basically the gift of mother nature. You know, some some really logical minded people might hear that and think that's like new age mumbo jumbo and it's silly and it's stupid and it's like believing in a fairy tale. Um, but what religion isn't? And this isn't even a religion, this is just a, a hobby. You know, it's a it's a fun pastime, but it's something nice to believe in I think anyway what what do you think I'm, I'm curious what I don't worry I'm not inviting you for arguments and digression I'm just curious to know like what do what do you feel about that um it won't hurt my feelings at all if you think it's all silly hocus pocus mumbo jumbo like that's fine I'm I'm not um emotionally invested in the reality of of gemstones and crystals I'm just sharing with you now that I like them and wouldn't it be cool if they really are magical little talismans all right guys I've I have talked your ears off long enough um I've gone way off topic in the in the time it took me to do my rant about veganism and pose my questions about whether or not you think that I should use my YouTube channel to you know share about crystal and gemstone healing in this time I could have easily told you all the other funny retail stories I had on my list but but alas I did not manage my time in this video properly so that, that will be saved to a future video if there's enough interest in it and meanwhile just about my shop thank you from the bottom of my heart to those of you who have bought things from me in the past couple of months um, because the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been truly devastating to micro businesses. Um, my numbers for, for two months were less than half the sales figures I had last year in the same period. And I, I mean, it's, it's kind of, on one hand, it's nice that I've had at least some sales coming in. So I've been able to you know, keep paying my rent and, and feeding my cats and feeding myself, but um, it doesn't really allow for any room for growth as far as stocking new materials goes or improving my video quality with a, with a tripod that's not wobbly and broken. So it's like on, on one hand, I, I'm grateful at least I've had some work, but on the other hand, I, I, I would really like it if business was booming again. Um, so for those who have supported the shop and, and for those who have become Patreons, sorry, patrons on Patreon, just thank you so much. 
I've noticed other YouTubers will, will give a list of the names of all of their patrons. I'm not doing that because I respect the privacy of the people who sponsor my channel and I don't know. I'll ask them, you know what, on, on May 30th or 31st, the last Sunday of the month, um, on the last Sunday of every month, I have a, a big Zoom call with all of my patrons and we just chat and share stories and sometimes we share art and so I'll ask them if, if I should share their names like other YouTubers do with their patrons. But regardless, uh, same goes for the people who have bought jewelry from me. I'm not naming you because um, I don't know if you want that or not, but just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yeah, like I said, if, if any of you guys want those two photocopies of my watercolor painting that I showed earlier in the video, um, if you do decide to buy anything from my Etsy shop, just mention in the comment that you saw this video and that you would like one of those color copies and I'll, I'll sign it and write you a little note on it. And I mean, I always send a free gemstone talisman to everybody who shops from my store, whether they mention my channel or not. But if you mention this video, I'll send you two little gifts. I'll, I'll send the regular gemstone talisman, which I would send whether whether you mention it or not. And I'll also send a little angelite, like the, the stone on this bracelet, um, just because it has a really sweet, happy springtime energy. And it is one of my favorite, favorite stones to put under my pillow when I sleep at night because whenever I do that, I just have really cool, vivid dreams and just a really good, deep sleep. So that that's a little something I'd like to share. That's, that's it for this video. I really appreciate you for watching. Thank you for inviting me into your life for so long. If you've been drawing or painting as I've been talking, post a picture of your art on Instagram and tag me because I would love to see it and share it with others to inspire them too. I look forward to reading your comments. For me, reading comments under a video is as exciting as getting a letter in the mailbox. I, I truly enjoy it. So if you comment on the video, I, I look forward to that. And otherwise, just be well. Thank you for watching. Much love and we'll see you next time. Bye.